Father, we thank you for life in Christ. We thank you that the throne room is not off limits. Uh, you've invited us, people who, when we examine ourselves, begin to realize we don't belong there. And yet you've qualified us to come in your son. And so we pray that we might, as our prayer book uh, instructs us, uh, to come boldly, not because we're brash or arrogant, but we can come boldly now because you have prepared the way through your son. So thank you, O oh Lord, for the privilege of worship. And we ask that you guide us in this final class as we think about our Anglican heritage. Jesus' name, amen. 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 Now, uh, it was a bit uh, unrealistic of me to think that we could do this in three lessons. No. So, <laughs> at least me. So, we're not going to be able to finish. So, what I'm going to promise to do uh, once we finish today is I am going to do a, a series of sermons, maybe a couple, because I think two things particularly. <clears throat> would be good to give more attention to. One is the prayer of humble access. That's a very rich prayer and it troubles a lot of people too because it says what it says about what we believe in pretty stark terms. Eat the body, drink the blood. I mean, that's, you know, back in the day, Christians were locked up for being cannibals, you know, because they, they heard that terminology and they thought, eh. Yeah. So, so it's pretty pretty stark statement of what we believe. So I'll, I want to do a, d dedicate a sermon to that. And then I think I'd like to dedicate a sermon to uh, the closing, the prayer of communion that we do. Uh, it, it's pretty rich too, because we're going to get to just about everything but those two things, God willing. <coughs> we, 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 we finished last week right before the <coughs> prayers of the people. <coughs> so that's where we'll pick up today. <laughs> this is still part of the liturgy of the word. We didn't finish that last week. What are the two major movements in our litur in our worship service? Liturgy of word and sacrament. Word and sacrament. Yeah, those are the two major, and we have four movements in total: in entering, gathering, word, sacrament, and dismissal. They all have theological significance. So we're still in the liturgy of the word and we're talking about the prayers of the people and the prayers we do on Sunday are built on the foundation of the assumption that there is a praying community and thank God we are that. I thank God for Sammy Joe taking over the, the prayer ministry and Cheryl who, who developed it before that. Um, and for all of you who pray faithfully for one another and for issues beyond our congregation, it's so important that we are a prayerful people. Uh, and for example, on a Sunday morning, we don't just willy-nilly show up. Uh, before we begin worship, the worship team gathers in my office every Sunday and we pray committing that service to God and asking him to open our hearts to receive what he has. And before we've even gathered uh, the altar guild, not only do they put stuff out where it's supposed to be, uh, they have a prayer that they pray uh, to dedicate themselves to that <coughs> service and to dedicate the, uh, the all the utensils and stuff we do that facilitates worship. Um, the vestry meets monthly, and we pray. Uh, the deacons in our verger meet. We try to meet monthly. We haven't done that lately, but we meet regularly, and we pray uh, when we meet. Uh, I try to pray for you by name, uh, weekly, if at least. Uh, and uh, and I ask you to pray for me. I hope you do. You know, I need prayer. Uh, so uh, we are prayerful, a prayerful people. And, prayer. I'm sorry? We pray for each other in morning prayer. And then we have morning prayer. Thank you. I had that and I didn't look at my notes. We, <laughs> we, we have our daily offices. 
and we faithfully do that. And 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 I love the the women do it their way. The men have a own way. We spin the bottle, <laughs> and and, uh, and and somebody gets selected to lead it. And and the men are are really good at doing that. And, and we try to do it prayerfully. Uh, sometimes we're a little rowdy, but most of the time we, we get ourselves together uh, and, and, and come back to what we're there for, and we pray. We pray to God for our needs. We pray for one another, and the women do the same thing. Um, and we don't. I won't go through it here, but you know, if, if you look at your prayer book, if you haven't, you know, in the daily offices section where there's morning prayer, evening prayer, noontime prayer, uh, evening prayer, Compline, there's also a shortened form. That, you know, if you're in a hurry, sometimes we all are, you can do your morning prayer shorter. You know, there's, there's a shortened vers version of that. <clears throat> I tend to do my own, oftentimes, uh, I use Luther's old uh, way, and that is I say the Lord's Prayer. Uh, not the Lord's Prayer. I say the Ten Commandments. Uh, I then say the Confession, as we say it. I say words of absolution and comfort. Um, and then I say the Apostles' Creed. Then I say the Lord's Prayer, which leads me then into intercessory prayers. And so that's that's a, a, a thing I use when I'm on the run, literally moving, <coughs> walking out, or on my motorcycle. Uh, no, that's a little more dangerous. Right? You know, you run, it's all now. <laughs> so we, we need to pray. And I, I'm so grateful that we have a prayerful congregation, which makes what we do in here uh, more effective because when we gather <clears throat> we gather as the body of Christ that terminology is used all through the Bible and we're the body of Christ local the body of Christ is also down the street at Christ of the Hills in Balboa uh, but we're the body of Christ local here and part of the inter universal church as well uh, so as the church as Christ's body we share in his priestly ministry. You know, I use the term, we use the term priest for pastors in our denomination, but we're all priests unto God. Uh, we share in his priestly ministry. And one aspect, one major aspect of the priestly ministry is intercession, offering prayers and our concerns to God. That's what priests do. So we pray for ourselves in a confessional, contrite way. We pray for others, and we do so in the quiet of our own homes, and we do it <coughs> when we gather. And it's a, it's a privileged part of our worship to pray. Now, in our tradition, it's easy to, for that time to become a time to daydream because it can be longer than others. Like uh, the standard rite, uh, the deacon now reads the prayer, and it's, it's lengthy. And all you get to do is some, you know, is say something. Yeah, and and even now, that but the prayers are shorter now. But anyway, I'm just saying it's 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 an easy time to to zone out, and 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 it's like everything else. You really get out of worship <clears throat> what you put into it, and and so it's a discipline for all of us. And if you're not accustomed, most of us now are fairly accustomed to the way we do things. But with someone who isn't, it, it's easy to get distracted because it's, there's a lot. You know, some people complain, it's too hard, it's too complicated. Well, you know, some things good are, you know, most things that are good and profitable are hard, <laughs> you know. Uh, but anyway, so it, it's, it's something to do. Uh, there it is. Look at 1 Peter 2. Just to reiterate this biblical truth that I mentioned 1 Peter 2 wait where am I oh 2 I'm sorry I couldn't yeah yeah we'll, start, well, we'll just start with 1 Put away all malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander, like newborn babes, long for the pure spiritual milk, that it, but by it you may grow up into salvation, <clears throat> if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, 
There's this intercessory thing coming to God in prayer. A living stone, he is, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house. That's what we are as the church. To be a holy priesthood. That's what we are. We are being built by God to be a holy priesthood. Offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So that's what we do as a as a as a church, and uh, uh, doing it in this fashion uh, helps us con uh, put in words what we all want to say. Sometimes you know you go to pray and you don't know what to say. You know it just it doesn't always come. But written prayers like we use are well vetted theologically sound and they really help us say what we want to say and then Paul gives us in sec in first Timothy Paul gives us directions and we follow this in our prayer book he gives us directions uh, regarding our public prayers so Timothy Timothy's sometimes hard to find but he's there first Timothy 2 right after Thessalonians, right after the Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. So 1 Timothy 2, Paul gives us directions. He says in verse 1, First of all then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people. That's what's supposed to characterize our prayers. And then he gives some details for kings and all that are in high positions that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. God is sovereign over the rulers and God wants us to pray for them. And so it's interesting when you come to our prayer book, we have two different outlines for these prayers. The ones we're using right now are the renewed ancient text, which begins on page 123. That's where the text begins. <coughs> the prayers are, are, are 128. So I'm just going to show you these, and then we'll look at, at, at something else. So that's, that's the prayers of the people we're using right now. Uh, a more shortened version for the peace of the world, for the well-being, unity of the people of God, Lord, your mercy, hear our prayer, etc. And then back in the ancient standard text, which is uh, on page one ten. What's the, one ten? Is that where the prayers are? Yeah. One ten. Uh, we we tend to use this uh, right during Advent and Lent, typically. But the, it, it's the same uh, format, but the, the, you know, they're longer prayers. The, the, at least what the, the leader says is longer. And then the, the people still respond, hear our prayer. And then if you remember the litany, remember the great litany? I didn't plan to show you that. I think it's on page 100. Uh, yeah, the great litany. Well. Oh, it's back a few pages. This is the one where... I'm huh, sorry? Yeah, page 91. We probably should pray it more often, but, you know, you're supposed to pray it a, a couple... It, it's directed a couple of times a year, and then it also says in times of distress or national uh, catastrophes or things like that. Um, yeah, say, on page 99 it says, it is particularly appropriate to use the Great Litany on the first Sunday of Advent and the first Sunday of Lent. <clears throat> We've done that sometimes. It is also appropriate for rogation days, that is days related to the harvests and things especially for people that were dependent upon that, you know, that was a big deal. Other days of fasting or thanksgiving and occasions of solemn and comprehensive 
entreaty. So, and if you remember the litany, it's just so rich and full. It's very lengthy because it covers everything, you know, everything possible. Uh, but these are wonderful prayers that the church leaders have given a lot of thought to. And uh, it says a lot about our congregation that we are able to do this. Uh, and then on page 140, it just gives us in our rubric, well, that's not what a rubric, oh yeah. Well, it's not a rubric, it's additional directions. If you'll notice, at, in, <coughs> look on page 139 <coughs> to help you with your prayer book. See page 139? It says additional directions concerning Holy Communion. Almost every segment section of our prayer book has one of these either right before it or usually right after it just to give you more instructions as to how you can use either that rite or that daily office or baptism or holy matrimony or whatever after those sections of the prayer book you'll get pages of instruction like this and so on page 140 it tells us in both the Anglican, at the top of the page, in both the Anglican standard and renewed ancient text, other forms of prayers may be used, provided the following concerns are included. And these are, goes back to what Paul said, remember, that prayer should be made for all people, and then he listed some. The universal church, the clergy and people, the mission of the church, the nation and all in authority, the peoples of the world, the local community, those who suffer and those in any need or trouble, like we do our uh, prayer list there, and then thankful remembrance of the faithful departed and all the blessings of our lives. Those things should characterize our corporate prayers uh, when we gather, and we do those. Uh, now, do you all know, <clears throat> most of you do, probably it'd be good to ask this to the whole congregation, how to get a name on our Sunday prayer list. Does everybody know how to do that? Mm -hmm. a book. There's a book, and it's usually on that little table when you first yeah, come in. Okay. And then one thing we probably don't do as well, which is okay. I mean, God doesn't care, I don't think. <laughs> but, but that on some Sundays we pray and be for so-and-so as they travel, and they're sitting in the congregation. They've already traveled, uh, which is fine to keep praying for them, I suppose. But it probably wouldn't be a bad idea for the way we use our prayer book is that if that prayer has been answered to your satisfaction, it's okay to scratch through it. You're not hurting God's feelings or anybody else's feelings. And you can give thanksgiving. And you can give a thanks. Thank you. That's yeah. very good. Because there is a place. There is a place for that. Exactly. We forget to do that. We do. Father Rick, um, at one time when I was um, leading prayers for in uh, near Memphis. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Specifically, I left the time I paused at the end of each prayer before I allowed them to say the hear, hear our prayer. Mm -hmm. I paused and people would speak out mm -hmm. a person or a place or a congregation that they knew needed mm -hmm. prayer for that purpose. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know if you want to do it, that. It could work. I mean, we give chance at the end for people to do that. But it's not inappropriate if you think of something to blurt it out. I mean, that's not, no one's going to come arrest you. <laughs> I do occasionally hear people, uh, when we're praying for the, the uh, departed, sometimes people will speak out of person, <coughs> not loudly, but enough that I could hear them from the front. Right. So this, this is the prayer book, the prayer list book. And, uh, you know, sometimes people tell Mary Lou or others and they write it on here because it's the same handwriting and it's pretty good handwriting. <laughs> Often people don't take care with what they write and so whoever's reading the prayer says bleh because they don't know. <laughs> God knows at that point but you just kind of say it and sneeze or something. Well, people uh, can also either text or call or whatever right. if, during the week if they think of it or if it's a particular issue at that time, go ahead and call and let me know Right at that time and I'll put it on there. Yeah, that's good to know in case anybody's listening. If you have a prayer concern, you can't get it on the list yourself. Call Mary Lou or call Sammy Joe yeah. uh, 
uh, and it'll get put on the list. Uh, and it is good to put it on there in a way that's legible. <laughs> that, that would be nice, but uh, and then I tell you one thing that I really like about the liturgy of this church. I was born and raised a Baptist, mm -hmm. and I'm used to going in and the preacher does the whole thing. He, he tells you all the things that you did bad and all the things <laughs> that you need to do and all these things, right. and he's the one that does everything. Right. The first time I visited an Episcopal church was, uh, what, 1985? And I was blown away. Yeah. Everybody participated. I know. <laughs> I mean, well, you, you learn something. You, you learn something other than being shouted down to. Exactly. And I'm not really putting the bad <coughs> church down. They're good and all that. But it's, it's a different liturgy. It, it is. is. Well, you know what the word liturgy but means? Partic participate. Participatory. The word liturgy means the work of the people. Yeah. So it's 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 designed to be a concert, you know, a chorus where we're all in harmony, saying things, you know. So that's a good so thing. All, all these things mean a lot. They do. And uh, and a lot of it's up to us to how much how meaningful they'll be on any given Sunday because I mean we we are and you know I'm not we're not trying to beat anybody up I'm distracted a lot and I'm leading the service I mean I have to be honest sometimes my mind goes well, and I have to go Shh. <laughs> you know because it's like you that's know, why I keep my finger on the place well that's right that, that, that helps out. right there so but it is it, it is a discipline for all of us to keep focused because yeah. uh, it's easy to get <laughs> Okay, so let's, um, we're not going to get near through this, but that's all right. That's okay. Uh, oh, and one other thing. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I will. I have a note in here. Where did I, Wait, where did I put it? It is in here, though. Okay. Uh, you know, another thing to mention, I, um, let me get it, because I forgot. It's, aren't those calendars back here? Yes, those calendars. <laughs> and one thing that uh, we do, too, it, it says in that, in our word, words of instruction in the, in the prayer book that I just read, it said, the last one, thankful remembrance of the faithful departed and of all the blessings of our lives. So we do pray for saints. Now, we've, we've been trying to correct, and I, I think we have recently in our prayers, we worded it in, confusingly for a while when we say prayers for the saints because we don't want to give the impression that we're praying to the saints, yeah. which we're not. So now we've inserted the words, give thanks for. That, that's what we're doing. And, and those come from this. Uh, I come from our prayer book. But they've just mm -hmm. taken them, put them here to make it easier for us to find. So on any given month, you'll see the list of several saints on their day. Like, where are we? This is June um, yeah, yeah, today's Father's Day. Uh, and if you, one of the saints listed is Sundar Singh, an, evangel an evangelist in India and teacher of the faith 1929. Now we can't do them all. So Mary Lou, I think you should no, do it. Margaret's doing, doing that yeah. now. Goes through and picks out one for each Sunday for us to remember. Uh, and to give thanks for, because, you know, God uses his people to do amazing things. And so it's important for us. To, and, and it's interesting, too, when you read the book of Revelation, how, how the martyrs are singled out and the people who have lived faithfully and given their lives. And we want to make sure that we give proper due respect and thanks to God for those who've gone before us, because we do stand on their shoulders in a big sense. 
So we pray for them as well, give thanks for them, I should say, during that part of our prayer. And then it comes to, and then if you're following on page 123 and beyond, that's, that's the liturgy we're looking, we're using as our guide, the renewed ancient text. We should be on about page uh, 12. Yeah, after the prayers of the people, we say our confession. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because we've talked about it before, but um, I can't think of the word, but anyway, up to this point, we've we've heard we've been doing the liturgy of the word, so we've we've heard God's word in reading, preaching, praying, and so forth. And so our response is to stop and to remind ourselves that <clears throat> we haven't. <laughs> we haven't loved God with all our heart and our soul, our mind, and our strength, as the commandment says. And we haven't loved our neighbor as ourselves. Uh, so we confess. And the word confess simply means to say along with. That we're saying in, in agreement with God, I have sinned against you or against my neighbors. And, and we confess. And we do it corporately when we gather, even though we should all be doing it individually, you know, in our hearts. Uh, and I would remind you, too, to not be afraid of the word absolution. We use that word. Um, I don't think it's used in our prayer book, is it? It doesn't say it. But... Oh, good. Thank you. Yes. So it does. It does include the word absolution. You know, I grew up in a tradition that you know you'd run away from that word because it just had connotations of, of the Catholic Church and the sacerdotal, even though we wouldn't have used that word, priesthood. But uh, it's not. It's a. It's a good word, actually. It, the word itself means to set free, to be absolved, is to be set free and and for us in the service it's a pronouncement uh, it is an announcement of good news and and when you look in in Matthew I believe it's 18 we don't have time to really look at these but where and it's in several of the synoptics uh, where Jesus talks about giving the keys of the kingdom whatever you bind on earth will be bound on earth Whatever you bind in heaven should be bound in heaven and so forth. The church has interpreted that as, as really this, the pronouncement of absolution and, and the promise of entering the gates of heaven. And that's pretty awesome when you think about it. It's not the priest who has some kind of authority to say that and make it true. That's not true. Uh, anybody can absolve another person of sin. If their faith is in Jesus, our response is, by faith in Jesus, you are absolved of your sin. And that's the truth. Because, G oh, I can't point there, but the cross that I usually point to, you know, there's another one there. You know, because of the cross, they're all over the place. <laughs> we, we can say that we are absolved of our sins because of what he did on the cross. And so we're saying that publicly uh, in, a, in a liturgical setting because you are forgiven and we are hearing those words of Jesus, uh, arise, be forgiven, and go and sin no more. That's the way we should be thinking about this. You know, not like, oh good, I get a chance to go do it again, you know. That, I mean, we often do, <laughs> but that shouldn't be the heart's desire of the Christian. Go and sin no more is what Jesus said. Yes, ma'am. Talking about absolution, uh, and, I, and I don't mean to interrupt, but... no. One of the things I think that the reason we don't play a lot of music in our church that is contemporary is because of the theology of it. And I don't know if any of you noticed in the song that Kimberly sang about um, forgiveness. And she talked about standing before God and having to see all of your sins. Well, what the scriptures tell us that they're gone. 
They're not going to show up again. You're not going to get in heaven and God's going to say, oh, well, you did this and you did this and you did this and you stand there in shame. That's not going to happen. Right. Right. And so the, when she said that, that's what the reason that our, the songs we play here are theologically sound. And that's a gift that is given to us through our hymn book is that we're not hearing these things that we go, oh man, you mean I'm going to have to stand up there and see all of that? Uh -huh. no, so anyway, right. I just wanted to bring that up. Amen. Yeah, you're right, because Colossians says Paul... That, well, yeah, their sins are gone. They're nailed to the tree. And then if, if you can, you know, if you run east, just keep running, you won't catch west. True. And that's what Jesus says, that your sins are separated as far as the east is from the west. You know, you can't get there by going that way. <clears throat> I mean, you know, I don't, I don't know what that becomes because I'm not, but my mind doesn't work that's that That's a, a huge heavenly gift. It is. Huge. And I was, what I was pointing to, I, don't, I can't find it right away, but where Paul you, talks about the songs we sing and that they're to instruct, mostly. I mean, they're designed to instruct, not to titillate. Even though I love to be titillated by music. I love music, <laughs> you know? <laughs> they're not sovereign yet. <laughs> not that all. But, the yeah. term absolution yeah. is, is <laughs> loosed in the morning prayer after the confession. Mm. It's, if, if we had clergy that were saying it, yeah. Yeah. Actually, on uh, 13. Page 13. <clears throat> yeah, we use it in morning prayer. Grant your absolution and remission of sin. Oh, that's true. Okay, yeah, I do say that. I On uh, Sunday, uh, Wednesday morning yes. for prayer, we use the word absolution, which I think is a, is a good word that we, we don't need to be afraid of. And I don't know if you remember, we did the Instructed Eucharist in church that time. Brandon was leading it. I mean, I was preaching and doing the service, and he was the narrator. And one of the things that he emphasized, and that was in our notes to emphasize, was that that's one point in the service when you should look up at the priest. Yes. Not again. It's not it having to do with the priest, but it's it's a it's a visual of of of, of reminder. Yeah, you know, like in the Old Testament when they were all bitten by serpents because of their sin. And Moses remedied that by making a bronze serpent on a pole. And he said, look, <laughs> look. And you get what's been promised in the thing. And again, the looking doesn't do it, but it's, it, is a, it is a liturgical visual uh, of what is being said in absolution. And, and it's a good time to look up and see the sign of the cross being made, you know, because, and hear those words of absolution, and, and we should take that to heart, and remember, not like, he did a bad job, or he didn't do that right, <laughs> but like the cross, that should be our thinking, the cross, not how it's done or anything else. Uh, and then we repeat the words of comfort. And basically just another way to hear the gospel. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden. And see, the ones who are heavy laden are the ones who come. If a person is not heavy laden, they're not going to come. But the fact that you come is something saying that the Holy Spirit has been at work in your life, giving you that heaviness about your sin. Most people don't give a rip about their sin, so they don't come to God. Why would they? But people who come to God regularly do so because they're heavy, brokenness about their sin. And so come to me, you heard. It's not a it's not like, oh, you're a heavy laden person. No, you know. No, that's that's a that's a good <laughs> statement there. Come to me, all you who are what I can't think of it now. Yeah, who are what's the word before that? Heavy laden. No, who are laboring. It's amazing, the brain. And you know, I don't think that you necessarily at that point realize it was your sins that are making you heavy laden. It's just that, no. that at least for me, I felt like everything was out of control and, and that there wasn't a right. way out of the mess I'd gotten myself into. So I don't yeah. know that I was at that point really thinking yeah. it was my sin. Right. 
And I'm using sin very yeah. broadly there. Yeah, it's it's not it's not specific sins necessarily that are making you feel a certain way. It is the brokenness of it all. Yes. You know, this we don't have shalom right now in in the universal sense because our bodies are broken. I don't feel good today. You may not feel good today. And we're broken, you know, and the world is broken. And on some days you see it more up front than others. And that burdens you. So, and, and we have someone to come to who can say, it's going to be all right. You know, it's going to be all right. I'm in charge. Right. So, yeah, that's that's the idea. So, thank you. Uh, but in the words of con uh, words of condemnation, the words of comfort, I like to include, though they're not in the prayer book, we, we do have a list of words you can say, and I usually say one or two of them, but I like to add the Romans 8, that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That, that should just give us all kinds of relief every week to hear that, and then to respond with Psalm 103, bless the Lord, oh my soul. So we gonna do so so confession is good for the soul <laughs> okay before so now we're just now getting ready to the liturgy of the table <laughs> and so before we receive holy communion we pass the peace uh, and what it is it, it's really a, a, a renewal of our obedience to the command of Jesus where he says in Matthew 5 24 before you come to the altar First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Uh, and it's an admonition from Paul, and I didn't write this one down. Let me read it. In Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 13, 11, where he says, Finally, brothers, rejoice. Aim for restoration. <clears throat> Comfort one another agree with one another live in peace and the peace and the and the god of love and peace will be with you so that's paul's admonition to us too is to work at restoration in all things we all get ticked off with people even in this loving body we may look at somebody in the wrong way or maybe you overlook them in a certain way or whatever you're gonna get offended and our job is to seek to see that restored, reconciled. That's what we do. If, no, if we're not doing it, who's going to do it? The people out there don't care. They just soon run over you. But, you know, <laughs> we're supposed to reconcile with one another. And that's not always easy. It's not as simple as, ah, don't worry about it. You know, I mean, sometimes you do have to worry about things. Some things are deep and ugly, and you have to work through them. But the passing of the pieces again, is one of those visual things that says, you know, yes, I'm reconciled with God. That's what we just did in, in confession and absolution. I am right with God, but it shouldn't stop there. I've been right with God. Now I got to make sure that I'm trying to be right with others. And so it goes from God to people, people to person, person to persons. So it, it should be like that, this whole matter of reconciliation and peace. Uh, and it's not just for our own private enjoyment, you know, being reconciled with God. So then we move, then the actual transition into the communion service begins with the offertory. Um, and the offertory is more than what we, you know, growing up in the, in the again, I hate, like Bruce, I hate to, beat up on the Baptist, but that's where I grew up, so I can relate to it. Uh, it was just a way to get money, pretty much. Uh, and that's not, that is part of it. You know, we, we're bringing our, but think of the offertory as something we're offering to God, and, and, it, and we see it, you see it visually in our service, because there's two, two movements. What are the two things we're doing in the offertory? that you see happening in the congregation and so forth. Can you? Collecting and then yeah. The, the elements are collecting. And what's being collected? Yeah, and, it's the bread and the wine as well. As the yeah, wine. so it's not just the money. We're bringing someone physically brings down the elements. The elements. Yeah. Uh, and in the old days, you know, 
I mean, we live in the modern age, so it kind of skews it just a little bit, but we don't bring down grapes uh, oh, and, and wheat fruit. or barley or whatever. We, we bring down what's already been made. So it's, it's, it's supposed to represent before God, we're bringing the works of our hands and laying it before you. Because as we say, all things come from you. All the bread we eat, all the wine we drink, all the whatever we do, the money we have in our pockets, everything is from you. And so the offertory is a pretty important part of our service, very important, because it represents not just money, but it represents giving of ourselves. Because not, he has given us. Because they, they he has given us. They said it was, the church was quite um, messy because they would be bringing their grain. I bet you it was. Grapes and their bread. And maybe some animals. Stinky yeah, animals. Yeah, the altar and, and setting it down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sure it was It was not pretty. Just, right. The Old Testament was even worse. I mean, you had blood everywhere. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that was pretty nasty. Um, Look at, uh, I don't remember what this is, but let's look at it. Bottom of page 131 in your prayer book. During the offertory, this is the rubric. See, under the word offertory. The celebrant may begin the offertory with one of the provided sentences. And that's in here somewhere. I have them written down on a page in my notebook of things suggested to say before you begin communion. Excuse me. During the offertory, a hymn, psalm, anthem may be sung. The deacon or priest prepares the holy table for the celebration, and representatives of the congregation may bring the people's offerings of bread and wine and money or other gifts to the deacon or priest, uh, etc. And you know, we, it's at this time, too, another offering that we don't think about, perhaps. We have money. We have the elements, the works of our hands, and we have music. Uh, Christy plays a beautiful piece for us, and I thank God for a, a godly Christian woman as our musician. Not everybody cares as much about that. <laughs> and so that's a wonderful gift that we have. And and going back to the whole idea of prayer, you know, the vestry prays, the altar prays, everybody prays, Christy prays. Christy prays over her selections uh, and and uh, what she's gonna do week to week. And we, we work together on that, but she's uh, prays about what she selects. And uh, I'm very grateful to have her for that because it is a, a congregational offering that she's making for us, with us, uh, to the Lord. So it's a beautiful part. Um, and then once there, uh, and so uh, and I don't know if you know this, uh, the people who bring down the uh, elements didn't just have an epiphany, but they are selected. Uh, some of them may have had, but, but the acolyte, who selects them? The acolyte? acolyte. The acolyte selects who's bringing down the elements, and then the ushers have a team <coughs> that present the money, uh, take it up, and, and bring it back down to be received. Uh, so it's a beautiful thing. And then after they're brought to the table, we we stand and sing the doxology, the glory of Patri. You know, all glory be to God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So, so we get then to, we're done with the offertory. We're moving along. This is like the transition into the uh, liturgy of the table, the sacrament. Now, it doesn't have it in our prayer book, but in the old prayer book, the 79 prayer book, it may have been in the 28 too, I'm not sure. This whole thing, the liturgy of the table, is referred to as the great thanksgiving. Uh, and that's where the word Eucharist comes from. Some, some call this the Lord's table. Some call it Holy Communion. Some call it a Eucharist, the Eucharist, which just means thanksgiving. Uh, but the whole 
liturgy in in many prayer books are called is called the great uh, what did I say the great thanksgiving. So it's the entire liturgy. It be what does mass that word mean? <coughs> Because in my other Episcopal church, and when I was there, <coughs> and it was a high church, they called it mass. The mass. It doesn't have to do with departing. The people were. I didn't know if it had I didn't to look. do with because the Catholics call it mass. Yeah. So I. Mass. Here's what I think, and then you can correct me because I'm often wrong. <laughs> Keep an eye on me. Uh, <laughs> but I think it has to do, isn't it? Somebody correct me. That when the clergy would dismiss the people who were not eligible, oh, right. the great amen. After the great they weren't amen. eligible to take communion. They had to leave. Ah. I think it's connected to that, but I could be wrong. So they left in mass. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. 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 Or they may have been non-Catholics who just were there for the word and they weren't allowed to take. They were allowed to. I don't know if I'm right on that, but. Uh, yeah, they go to mass, right? So it's become a word to explain the whole service, yeah. And we've used that term before uh, when we call, I don't know why we just use it for the deacon's mass, but we often, I guess it's because it's typical and traditionally done. Uh, I don't really have a problem with it. Uh, I mean, it's just. But I, 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 I don't know the derivation as well as I should. So, uh, okay, let's move on in these last 10 minutes. <laughs> the first part of our communion service is uh, the prayers of thanksgiving. Well, we move into the prayers of thanksgiving and blessing, and they begin with, on page 132, with the old Jewish, ancient Jewish response, lift up your hearts which in latin is sursum corda that's the latin phrase for lift up your hearts and that's the primary words that are used in that part of the <coughs> the service so we begin with the sursum corda uh, jesus interestingly probably used these words uh, at that last supper either in Hebrew or Aramaic um, because it was a part of the ancient Jewish tradition. Um, and the Sursum Corda, as you notice on page 132, is followed by the proper preface, which is a short prayer um, that is related to the season or that particular occasion. Um, and so... Uh, usually the priest inserts that in there so you don't have to be turning back all through your prayer book to find it but there is a proper preface for today oh, for the entire season of Pentecost uh, you know like last week was what Trinity Sunday right yeah it was Trinity Sunday so we had a proper preface that you inserted between those two paragraphs on page 132 you see it, it says, is right and duty, etc. To give thanks to you, Father, on my career of heaven and earth. Then you insert a preface. Last week it had to do with the Trinity. <coughs> so the whole season of Pentecost doesn't have a different preface for every Sunday, but it's the preface of the Lord's Day is suggested. So you would find that on those pages and say that, and then you conclude the preface. And what the preface reminds us of uh, is that uh, wait a minute where am I yeah who, who the, 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 the universal cosmic nature of, of what's happening in our worship service uh, and again this eschatological thing where the age to come literally intersects with this present age. <clears throat> so we here on planet Earth are praising God in, in song and in praise, but it also reminds us in this proper, in, in the, uh, the words that, are, that conclude the proper preface, that we are joined with angels, 
by the archangels and your Christian parents or brothers or friends who are also in heaven, they're joining with us in worship. That's kind of cool. So I don't know exactly what that means, but it says it in the Bible. And uh, that's pretty awesome that uh, we're together worshiping the Lord right now together. Uh, <clears throat> and that Soctus follows the uh, Sursum Corda, which is the holy, holy, holy. We sing it, don't we? Yes. Yeah, we sing that. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> It's taken from a couple of verses. One is Isaiah 6. Remember when Isaiah had the vision of God lifted up on the throne? And his response was, holy, holy, holy. I'm sure a foreshadowing of a better understanding of the Trinity that was to come that they didn't necessarily have. But it was nonetheless true. There was a triune God back then too. Uh, and he acknowledged that God by the thrice holy exclamation holy 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 and then Matthew 21 9 is also included in the Sanctus uh, which says yeah and the, this was uh, at the triumphal entry and the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting Hosanna <clears throat> to the son of David Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. And we sing that in the Sanctus, <coughs> blessed is he. Now some, if you noticed, uh, do the sign of the cross there. I don't, I don't think, I don't. Uh, the only reason I can say that I don't is I read somewhere that you don't have to. So I don't. <laughs> but it, it is a tradition that many people do, and I think it's I think it's beautiful. So, so I don't know why. Uh, but it's okay either way. It's okay either way. But you will notice that I think Sammy Joe does it too, or and I know Linda does, and some of the others may know. But and it's up to you. But I just I just want you to know that we work. It's not anyway. <clears throat> Okay, page 132. We're going to have to finish with this. I may have to do a longer sermon series than I thought. Uh, page 132. <coughs> Here, this next portion, before we actually um, have the fraction, is called the Prayer of Consecration. And... Uh, it includes the words of institution and what is referred to as the epiclesis, uh, which is a Greek word that basically means prayer. Uh, but it's, it's a, you can see the first part, uh, the words of institution are the very first paragraph. Um, where the prayer of consecration begins on the night that it was betrayed. Well, there's a prayer up there in the beginning. Uh, <clears throat> and then it goes into the words of institution in the middle of 133 on the night that it was betrayed, mm -hmm. etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is taken from 1 Corinthians 11, pretty much verbatim, where Paul recorded what Jesus taught him directly about the Lord's Supper. Uh, and so this is pretty much what we have written in here on the night it was betrayed. And you notice there's four movements in Jesus's uh, on the supper, and it's the same thing we do. If you if you watch Jesus, oh, Jesus took the bread. Jesus blessed the bread. Jesus broke the bread. And Jesus gave the bread. So that's that's what communion. It's, it's taking 
is a, is a promise from God. Blessing, thank you, O Lord. His body was broken. Take this uh, given for you. So that's that's the movement of of this uh, what's happening here. And uh, <clears throat> you know we're instructed in the Eucharist to touch the elements and to do the sign of the cross over them. Doing that doesn't make this a sacrament. I don't have magic words. I don't have a magic touch. So that doesn't make it anything. It's a sacrament because Jesus says it's a sacrament and it's a promise. And so uh, I think it's as basic as these are the elements right here that are being consecrated. The ones right here, not those, these. These are being consecrated to use for this special sacrament. And so we say it. And then in the second part of the, the last part of the prayer, uh, it's, it's a prayer invoking the Holy Spirit to make this so in our lives and to consecrate us as well to that work. That's why on the top of the page 134 it says sanctify them, that is these elements. And then in the middle part it says sanctify us also. And we usually do the sign of the cross there, meaning that we are indeed consecrating ourselves. Explain consecrated. It basically means just to be set apart. Exactly. Yeah, it, it's, it's it's like you do your fine china, maybe. You know, you put it in your buffet instead of your cabinets, maybe, because you're setting it apart for special. I mean, that's one thing. Yeah, and we have been set apart for that by God. That, that's what holy means, really, uh, is you're set apart and involves purity in the whole thing. It has a moral connotation to it. But it, it means that God came and said, boo. I've got my affection on you and I'm I'm uh, I'm gonna love you and change you and use you and bring you home and then I'll just say too then we conclude with the great amen all this we ask through your son Jesus Christ um, and uh, here you, you tend to put the chalice and, and the reason for that if you notice some priests do this they just hold up both the chalice and the patent. I was taught, which is, you know, if you have a large enough host, priest host, to have the chalice and the host above it, which again is a picture that there's one presence in these two forms, that he's present in bread and wine by his promise, by faith. And and that's, that's why we do that. And then we, it is leading up to this great crescendo of doxology. We call it the great, I loved it when I was in, and I'll finish with this. In basic training, uh, my last assignment was back at Fort Leonard Wood. And that's when I was becoming an Anglican. Uh, I was an Anglican deacon, I think, most of that time. Uh, but I served at the Anglican service congregation. And of course, most of these soldiers weren't Anglican, but they wanted to get out of the drill sergeant's hair, so they'd come in mass, not in a, you know, uh, to service. There'd be like 140 of them in there. You know, it's like, oh, all these faithful Anglicans, <laughs> you know. But uh, but they loved this because our we had a real high speed young Anglican chaplain from California. He's kind of a hippie. Didn't have any hair, of course, because we're in the army. But he was a hippie, <laughs> nonetheless. Uh, but he loved to whip them up. And so it always say, this is the great amen. This is the crescendo of our worship service. And boy, that place would shake when they would say amen. <laughs> so that's what we're doing. It, it's leading up to this great crescendo. And we say, amen. It's all true. Thank God. All right. Well, we'll preach on the rest of it. Wonderful. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. This was a wonderful series. Yes. Thanks well, for doing this.